Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday night service. And we welcome those of you that are on Facebook tonight also. And tonight we're going to be in Revelation chapter 16. Revelation, the 16th chapter tonight. Remember those uh, on our prayer list, now in the bulletin, there's a pretty good list, you know, and you might want to look at that and be sure to remember those individuals in your prayers. Remember Ken and L.B. Uh, Burrow and uh, Daniel Lindsay, Renee Wallace, Louise Banks uh, had a stint uh, this uh, week and she's doing well. Uh, Linda Robinson uh, had uh, successful surgery. That's uh, James Duncan's uh, sister and uh, looks like she will not uh, have to have any uh, radiation or, or chemo. Remember Lexi Rudy, also Corey Rowe with his uh, tendon on his, on his finger. Anyone else that we need to mention here before we go to God in prayer? Okay, let's bow and pray together. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity we have to come here in the middle of the week to study your word, to worship you, to fellowship with other saints. And Father, we are grateful for all the things that you do for us. And we confess that we so often take these things for granted and, and we don't thank you enough for what uh, you do for us on a daily basis. We're thankful above all for Jesus, your son, and for his willingness to come into this world and to die on the cross so that we could have the opportunity to spend eternity with you someday. We're thankful for the church that he established. We're grateful, Father, for the Bible. We're thankful for your Holy Spirit, all other spiritual blessings that we have through your Son. And we pray that uh, you'll be with us tonight uh, as we study from your word. Help us to uh, take what we learn and make it applicable in our everyday lives. And we pray, Father, for those that we've mentioned tonight and those that are on our prayer list, that you'll uh, be with them in a very special way. Pray that you'll be with those that are sick, that you'll be with their caregivers and their families. Pray that you'll be with those that are bereaved at this time. Pray that you'll help us always to uh, do our best to uh, live for you and to walk in the footsteps of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, it's foggy out tonight, and so a lot of people didn't... Uh, brave it. I don't blame them. And uh, good to see those of you that are here. And uh, again, good to have those of you that are on uh, Facebook. In Revelation, we find a, a message of hope and a message of encouragement. And uh, I think often when we think of Revelation, we don't think of it uh, along those lines. But the uh, churches in uh, the first century uh, were being persecuted. Uh, they were being mistreated by uh, the Roman government. And they needed to be encouraged. Uh, the book of Revelation is written specifically to the seven churches of Asia, congregations that uh, were located in what is now Turkey. Some of them had already undergone some persecution. Others would face persecution. And in the midst of all that uh, is the message of hope, that God is still in control. Uh, the culprit, which is Rome, uh, is going to be defeated. You be on the Lord's side, and you'll be on the winning side. You stay faithful even to the point of death, and you receive a crown of life. Uh, that's uh, uh, the message of, of the book of Revelation. Uh, in the 15th chapter, uh, we see seven angels uh, who have seven uh, plagues, and they're given seven bowls of wrath. And uh, these uh, bowls of wrath are poured out in the 16th chapter. And uh, the seventh bowl is, is going to announce the defeat of Rome. Now, We've mentioned uh, 
at, at times as we've gone along that uh, individuals who think that the book of Revelation is just a prediction of what's going to happen uh, in a century after century in the future uh, wouldn't get uh, very much encouragement uh, if uh, the writer was telling about something that was going to happen, uh, for example, in the 1700s, or if uh, uh, if the writer was uh, talking about something that was going to happen in our day, that wouldn't encourage these these Christians who were suffering at the time. But then again, uh, he's writing a specific message to them. Uh, the The enemy is wrong, and we know. I mean, we're hundreds of years past that, that Rome is no more, not the, not the Roman Empire. Uh, and so we might say, well, you know, uh, this message was for them, but, you know, it's not really for us, but it is. Uh, because uh, the devil uh, has a way of using uh, governments, organizations to do his work. And he was using Rome uh, to do his uh, dirty work. And today he still uh, can use a nation, he can use a person, he can use an organization. He's still active, he's still powerful, uh, he's still up to his old tricks. History has a way of repeating itself. And so when we uh, look at our world today and see what the devil is doing to the world, it can be very discouraging. But then we can look at the book of Revelation and see how uh, by inspiration John was giving these early Christians uh, encouragement, giving them hope. And, and that uh, message is for you and me. Even though we're not living in the Roman Empire, we're still living in a wicked world. We're still living in a world where the devil is alive and well and doing his dirty thing. And so uh, I think we have to look at it in that way. Now. Uh, in uh, Romans, the uh, Romans were in Revelation. They both start with R, though. In Revelation, the 15th chapter, uh, we see a sea of glass. And the sea of glass is first presented in chapter 4. And uh, it represented a great distance between man and God. Uh, and the idea was that uh, man r really had a difficult time approaching God across the sea of glass. But here, uh, those who've been victorious are standing on the sea. Apparently now they have access, they can approach. The victory's been won, and they're in heaven, and they have access to God. Uh, we uh, made the point last week that uh, you've had uh, seven seals, and seals as they're broken reveal. Uh, a book, you know, Revelation, uh, is, is revealing, it's revealing something. Uh, and then we had seven trumpets. Trumpets uh, announce or they warn about something that's coming. Um, and uh, the seals uh, had been uh, broken. Uh, Rome had been warned. Trumpets had been sounded. They had been uh, warned again and they had not repented. Uh, and uh, so, uh, finally, uh, uh, God, it, he's going to punish Rome. Uh, he, he's had enough, and these, uh, these uh, bowls of wrath are going to be poured out on Rome, and, th and that's going to be, be the end of it. The seven bowls are, are similar to the seven trumpets. Uh, the seven trumpets are in chapters 8 through 11, and uh, the first trumpet, uh, you have... Uh, uh, a judgment on the earth. And when this first uh, bowl of wrath is poured out, so it's poured out on the earth. Uh, second the trumpet uh, was a warning uh, uh, to the sea. And here uh, in chapter 16, we read where the bowl of wrath is poured out on the sea. The third trumpet on the rivers and springs, third uh, bowl of wrath on rivers and springs, the fourth uh, trumpet uh, was uh, a pronouncement on, on the sun and heavenly bodies. And when the fourth bowl is poured out in chapter 16, it's on the sun. The result in, uh, on chapter 
so eight through 11 with the seven trumpets. Uh, the fifth one, you have uh, torment. And here you have pain. Uh, the sixth trumpet, uh, it, it talks about the uh, Euphrates River and an army. And when the sixth uh, a bowl uh, is poured out uh, here in the 16th chapter, it also talks about Euphrates uh, and, and, the, and the army. Um, let me look at my notes here. Okay, let's uh, let's begin looking then at uh, at chapter uh, sixteen. Okay, then I heard a loud voice from the temple. Now remember, the temple would be the the residence of God. Uh, when the uh, children of Israel built the tabernacle, that was uh, that was uh, the residing place of God. Later, the the uh, tabernacle was uh, replaced by by the temple, and the temple would be uh, the, the, the uh, abide abode of God. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. Okay. Uh, so the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image? Uh, people who had the mark of the beast; these were the the unfaithful. Uh, is he talking about the literal uh, sores, or is he using figurative language here? Uh, whenever uh, the plagues were given uh, upon Egypt. Uh, in, in Exodus 9, one of those plagues was, was boils. You remember that? Uh, and uh, the Old Testament was written in, in Hebrew. Uh, but uh, later, uh, in about 250 B.C., it was translated into Greek. Uh, and uh, there were about 70 men who made that translation. Uh, and uh, that translation is called the Septuagint. Septuagint meaning 70. Uh, and so you had a Greek Old Testament. Now, uh, the, the word for boil in the Septuagint, uh, and Jesus sometimes quoted from the, from the Greek uh, Old Testament, the Septuagint. Uh, the, the, word, the, the Greek word uh, in the, the Greek Old Testament uh, is the same, for, for boil, is the same word that's used here for source. And, and so you get the idea that they're talking about a, a, a sore that would be like a, a boil. But he's probably speaking figuratively here. Uh, these are symbols of pain. Uh, these are symbols of, of torment. Uh, and this, uh, I think, symbolizes the, the unhappiness, uh, the pain uh, that comes from sin, uh, the, the result of sin. Uh, that, that's the position that uh, I take on that. And then if you look at the, the uh, uh, third verse, the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became blood like that of a dead man and every living thing in the sea uh, died. Now, uh, and then look at the, look at the fourth uh, verse. Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And so you have blood uh, on the uh, second bowl. Uh, you have blood uh, on the third bowl. And remember in Exodus 7 that whenever the uh, uh, plagues were pronounced upon Egypt, you had water turning into blood. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you have it in the, in the sea. Uh, and it could be that, that what uh, he's saying here, the sea was such an important part of Rome and all the countries actually living around the Mediterranean. Uh, the, the sea was their main uh, mode of transportation. It was a way that they, uh, they traded, you know, commerce on the sea was a big deal. Um, and the idea that uh, uh, the sea was gonna become blood 
uh, seemed to be saying that at, at some point they weren't going to be uh, successful in traveling the sea, engaging in, in their successful commerce. Uh, and of course, this is the way they fought their battles too, was on the sea. Uh, but that would be greatly hindered at, at some point. Uh, and then also on the fresh waters. Uh, and look at uh, verse uh, 5 and 6. Uh, and I heard the angel of the waters saying, Righteous are you who are and who were, O Holy One, because you judge these things. For they poured out the blood of saints and prophets. Okay, so he's talking here, uh, I think about uh, about the enemy, about the culprit, which you know it seems to be Rome, uh, the the uh, uh, vehicle that the devil is using. They poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. Uh, payday someday uh, reminds me of uh, of Pharaoh. Uh, when uh, uh, he wanted to get rid of the, the um, Hebrews. Remember, he told them to take their baby boys and, and, uh, uh, and, and kill them whenever they were born. That didn't work out too well because of a couple of faithful uh, midwives. Uh, and, and then later, you know, the, the baby boys were to be cast in the Nile River. And then think what happened on the, on the tenth plague, uh, whenever the firstborn, even Pharaoh's firstborn, uh, died as a result of tenth plague. It's you know payday someday. Uh, they 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 went after blood, uh, and 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 that's what they received. And so he says here, uh, they poured out the blood of saints and prophets. You've given them blood to drink. They deserve it. Uh, okay. And then uh, uh, verse 7, And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Uh, then look at the fourth uh, angel uh, in verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to it to scorch men uh, with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent, so as to give him glory. Uh, and so they poured out the, this bowl of wrath on the sun, uh, and, and even, even when they were punished, uh, they wouldn't repent. What did they do? They blasphemed the name of God, spoke against the name of God. Now remember, uh, and this all seems to be hearkening back to what happened in Egypt. Uh, you know, Pharaoh would, would say, well, you know, I, I've, I've, decided to, I've, I've decided to give in. And, and then the Bible would tell us uh, over and over again that Pharaoh's heart would be hardened. Uh, and and some people have made the point, well, God made him do that. No, Pharaoh's heart was hardened because of the kind of individual he was. Uh, and, and, and the more, the, uh, the, the more uh, strict that God was with him and his country, the more he just bowled up and said no. And here you have, uh, I think, a, a picture of, of Rome, even, even though they've received, uh, uh, you know, these bowls of wrath, they're, they're stubborn. And, and they're not they're not giving in. Then you have uh, uh, verse ten. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened. And they gnawed their tongue because of pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. So they repented, right? They changed, right? No, and they did not repent. Of their deeds, uh, when it says that the fifth angel poured out his bowl on on the throne of the beast, uh, this probably is a reference to uh, the uh, the um, uh, leadership of Rome, and and they still didn't repent, still didn't 
uh, change uh, their ways. Then you get to the you get to the twelfth uh, 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 verse. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. Uh, Euphrates was dried up. Uh, and a way was open for, for the enemy to invade. And eventually, Rome was invaded. Eventually, they were overrun. Eventually, they did fall. Uh, and is this a prelude to that? Well, I think probably, probably so. Now, uh, I want us to look at 13 through, through uh, 16 here. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Uh, the the dragon uh, represents Satan. It's been well established in the book of Revelation. And out of the mouth of the beast, which seems to be wrong, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, which seems to be an instrument of Rome, uh, enforcing uh, the worship of idols. Uh, three unclean spirits like frogs, for there are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Hamageddon. Now, uh, probably most of you have heard of the of the, uh, the the Battle of Armageddon. People who uh, believe in premillennialism uh, believe that uh, uh, the. Uh, Lord is going to return before the thousand year reign. Pre means before, millennial refers to a thousand years. Uh, and and uh, let me read to you uh, what uh, the late uh, uh, Brother Wayne Jackson wrote regarding uh, premillennialism and, and some of the things they believed. Uh, and he said that uh, the, the theory of premillennialism, uh, it contends Christ, number one, Christ came to earth for the purpose of setting up his kingdom. That's what they say, he came to set up his kingdom. Well, he did come to set up his kingdom, didn't he? They're right about that. But their idea was he came to reestablish the Old Testament kingdom. Uh, but as he was surprisingly rejected by the Jews, he did not set up the kingdom, but rather, as an afterthought, established church instead. So the church, and these are my words, becomes an accidental institution set up because the Jews rejected Jesus. He came to set up this earthly kingdom on David's throne in Jerusalem, but the people rejected him. So uh, he, he went and used plan B, set up the church instead. Uh, number two, since returning to heaven, the bridegroom has tarried, but signs, especially Matthew 24, indicate that his return is imminent. Okay. Then thirdly, the first state of the Lord's coming will be quiet and invisible at which time the living righteous will be raptured, you've heard that term before, and dead saints resurrected. Fourthly, this uh, commences a seven-year tribulation period during the first half of which Solomon's temple will be rebuilt and the sacrifices of the law of Moses reactivated, while the latter portion of this span will involve bloody conflict, 
which is consummated by the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, now, it's interesting, where the temple stood, the Dome of the Rock stands today. That's uh, a Muslim uh, uh, a mosque, uh, and it's been there since 600 AD. They're going to have to tear it down if they're going to rebuild the, the, the Temple of Solomon. The fifth point uh, that the Brother Jackson made, Christ is then, after his Armageddon victory, to begin an earthly reign of a thousand literal years upon David's throne in Jerusalem, after which the wicked dead are to be raised, the judgment will occur, and eternity will commence. Now, here, here's, what, here's how he answers uh, those uh, suppositions of the premillennialist. He says, uh, first, Christ was not surprisingly rejected by the Jews. His rejection was prophesied centuries earlier. This is Psalm 118, verse 22. The stone which the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That's in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, a thousand years before Jesus was born. And that's quoted in 1 Peter 2. And so it, it wasn't a surprise that they rejected him. Uh, the Bible says he was going to be rejected. And he did establish the kingdom. They say, no, he didn't. Uh, the kingdom's coming in the future. Uh, but uh, we are transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. The Bible says, Colossians 1.13. And in this same book, the book of Revelation, in chapter 1, uh, uh, John says, I am your brother in the kingdom. How could he be the brother in the kingdom if the kingdom didn't exist? Well, he did establish his, his uh, uh, kingdom, and the kingdom is known as the church. If you look at Matthew 16, we, we can't go into the, you know, these things in detail, but in Matthew 16, he uses the word kingdom and, and the word church interchangeably. And, and, the, and the, the prophecies made concerning uh, the kingdom uh, are fulfilled when the church began, and vice versa. Uh, and, and the church is a part of God's eternal plan. And you'll hear about that in the near future in, in one of Evan's uh, sermons. Uh, uh, he's going through Ephesians. That's Ephesians 3. You won't leave that out, will you? Okay. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, and then secondly, while on earth, Jesus did not know the time of his final coming. Of that day and hour knows no man, no, not the angels in heaven, neither the Son, but only the Father. Mark 13, 32, similar wording in Matthew 24. He didn't give any, he, any signs about, about uh, his return. Uh, he said that he would come as a thief in the night, 1 Thessalonians 5. Um, and uh, he would come as a thief, 2 Peter 3, verse 10. And in this same book, Revelation 3 and verse 3, his return was going to be like that of a thief. Now, what makes a thief successful is that he comes at the time you least expect him. There aren't going to be any particular signs out there. He'll come when we least expect him. Okay. Uh, we, are we out of time? Okay, I'm going to mark the start right there. And uh, if you have an opportunity to read uh, some about the Battle of Armageddon, and uh, it, it's here in, in the 16th uh, uh, chapter, and uh, we, we read more about a thousand year reign, uh, or we'll talk about it when we get to Revelation chapter 20, but uh, we'll quit right there. Good foggy evening. Everybody doing well tonight? Good to see everybody. Good to have folks on Facebook. Be a good time to go ahead and silence your electronic devices if you haven't done so already. The next time, <clears throat> pardon me, the next time we'll meet will be Sunday morning at 9.30 for classes and then our service is about 10.05. Sunday evening we'll meet at 5.30 and then again Wednesday night at 7. 
Got a bunch of announcements. Some of them are repetitive, and I won't repeat all of them, but I'll go through most of these, and then if anybody else has anything that we overlook, we'll, we'll take those. Lance Liddell has COVID, but he is supposed to be out of quarantine Friday. How long is quarantine now? I don't even... Five days? Okay. Seems that depends on... I, I, yeah, I just hear different things. Jeff Brasher, of course, is doing well after getting some heart stents, and we're pleased about that. James Duncan's sister, Linda Robinson, had surgery. The doctor thinks he got all the cancer, and she is not expected to have any chemo or radiation. It's about the best news that you can get. Prayers are requested for Lexi Rudy of the Stanford community, currently in the Memphis Hospital for a series of tests. Is there anything new on that? Okay, Danny Archer is on a ventilator, Evan said a minute ago, doesn't know where he is. Tammy Toller's mom is, has been placed in hospice care at Greenacres. Miss Louise Banks had her heart procedure, got a stent, and she's doing very well. Ken and Naomi Burrow, of course, still request everybody's prayers. Evan's brother, Anthony, what's the latest on him? He's in St. Bernard. He's a little better. He can actually kind of breathe now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's in St. Bernard. Evan says his brother's still in St. Bernard, and they've taken some fluid off of him, and he can breathe somewhat better now. Corey Rowe will have surgery Friday in Little Rock to start the process of reattaching a tendon in his hand. To keep him in mind as well. Imogene and Christy have COVID, and Larry and Camille says they're better, doing much better. Also, we need to remind you that the elders intend to appoint Brian Oden to the eldership here at Commissary next Sunday, and they again appreciate everybody's input on that process, the selection. Is there anything else? Is anybody that we failed to mention? Anybody know? So. If not those that are participating in our service tonight, Wes will lead our singing, Evan will be our speaker, Wade Taylor will give us our closing prayer at the proper time, and at this time, Philip Rowe will have our opening prayer. Let's bow together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to thee for life. Thankful, Father, for all the blessings you have blessed us with. Help us, Father, to always realize that all the earthly things that we have here are gifts to us from Thee. We're very thankful, Father, for our spiritual blessings also. Thankful, Father, for Your willingness to give Your Son on the cross so that we might have the hope of spending eternity with Thee in heaven. Very thankful, Father, for those that labor on Your behalf. Especially, Father, we're thankful for those that labor with us. Thankful, Father, for all those throughout this country that work on your behalf, and very thankful, Father, for those that work in foreign fields. And ask, Father, that you would be with them and give them strength so your work would continue in these places and keep them safe as they do their duties there. We pray, Father, for peace. Pray, Father, throughout the world that, that the whole world might enjoy peace. Pray, Father, that the war in Ukraine would, would cease and that in Israel. We also, Father, pray for Haiti. Ask, Father, that law and order could be restored to Haiti. We're thankful, Father, for the security that we have in this country. We ask, Father, that you would always be with those that work to keep this country secure, keep them safe as they do their duties. Continue, Father, to be with us throughout our lives. Uh, always, Father, help us to, to just do the things that we should do uh, and, and hinder us from doing those things that we should not. Also, Father, we thank, thank you for our health, and we pray, Father, for the health of others, especially those, Father, that were mentioned here tonight. Pray, Father, it be your will. Keep, restore them back to their normal health. Continue, Father, to be with us. Forgive us, Father, when we sin. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Five hundred nineteen. Five 
Ramona. <clears throat> Holy in thee, O Savior mine, dwelleth my soul in peace divine. Peace that the world, though all combined, never can take from me. Pleasures of earth so seemingly sweet fail at the last my longings to be. Only in thee my bliss is complete. Only dear Lord, in thee. Only in thee, dear Savior, slain, losing thy life. Good evening. Good to see y'all tonight. If you would take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 113. The 113th Psalm. I think... What I'm about to share with you, I may have shared it a few years back. I cannot remember for sure if I did, so I decided if I couldn't remember for sure, y'all probably couldn't remember for sure either, so it probably wouldn't hurt to hear it again. But uh, I don't know if this is a true story, but it's a very interesting story eye-opening story, and it certainly can be true. It says, One day a very wealthy father took his son on a trip to the country for the sole purpose of showing his son how it was to be poor. They spent a few days and nights on the farm of what would be considered a very poor family. After their return from the trip, the father asked his son how he liked the trip. It was great, Dad, the son replied. Did you see how poor people can be, the father asked. Oh, yeah, said the son. So what did you learn from the trip, asked the father. 
The son answered, I saw that we have one dog and they have four. We have a pool that reaches to the middle of our garden and they have a creek that has no end. We have imported lanterns in our garden and they have the stars at night. Our patio reaches to the front yard and they have the whole horizon. We have a small piece of land to live on and they have fields that go beyond our sight. We have servants who serve us, but they serve others. We buy our food, but they grow theirs. We have walls around our property to protect us. They have friends to protect them. The boy's father was speechless. Then his son added, It showed me just how poor we really are. It goes on to say, Too many times we forget what we have and concentrate on what we don't have. What is one person's worthless object is another's prized possession. It is all based on one's perspective. Sometimes it takes the perspective of a child to remind us what's important, how true that is. Steve Inman's brother, Mike, where is it, Steve? Is it Guyana? Is that where he goes? Somewhere down toward South America, maybe? And he does mission work down there. And he comes back feeling sorry for us. They don't have anything down there, and they are so happy. really reminds me of what Dan spoke on a couple of weeks ago. They don't have anything, and Mike says he comes back and he feels sorry for us. Yeah, who, who's really the rich one? Who's really the poor one? Uh, James 2 verse 5 says, Has not God chosen the poor to be rich in faith? Here in Psalm 113, let's just read the whole thing. It's not very, it's not very long. Psalm 113 beginning at verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who dwells on high, who humbles Himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth? He raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the ash heap that he may seat him with princes, with the princes of his people. He grants the barren woman a home like the joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. Notice verse 7 in particular. He raises the poor out of the dust. He lifts the needy out of the ash heap that he may seat him with princes. Just like James 2 verse 5 says, has not God chosen the poor of the world to be rich in faith? It really reminds me of, uh, you know, I, I refer to country music a lot. Well, I'm going to do it again tonight. And I know we all know the song by Dolly Parton, Coat of Many Colors. It's, it's a classic, and it's got such a wonderful message. I'm just going to read the lyrics. Back through the years, I go wondering once again, back to the seasons of my youth. I recall a box of rags that someone gave us and how my mama put the rags to use. There were rags of many colors, but every piece was small, and I didn't have a coat, and it was way down in the fall. Mama sewed the rags together, sewing every piece with love. She made my coat of many colors that I was so proud of. As she sewed, she told a story from the Bible she had read about a coat of many colors Joseph wore, and then she said, Perhaps this coat will bring you good luck and happiness. And I just couldn't wait to wear it, and Mama blessed it with a kiss. 
My coat of many colors that my mama made for me, made only from rags, but I wore it so proudly. Although we had no money, I was rich as I could be, and my coat of many colors my mama made for me. So with patches on my britches and holes in both my shoes and my coat of many colors, I hurried off to school just to find the others laughing and making fun of me and my coat of many colors my mama made for me. And oh, I couldn't understand it, for I felt I was rich. And I told them of the love my mama sewed in every stitch. And I told them all the story mama told me while she sewed, and how my coat of many colors was more, worth more than all their clothes. But they didn't understand it, and I tried to make them see that one is only poor, only if they choose to be. Now I know we had no money, but I was as rich as I could be. And my coat of many colors, my mama made for me. Now, I love that line. They didn't understand it, and I tried to make them see that one is only poor, only if they choose to be. Now I know we had no money, but I was as rich as I could be. And my coat of many colors my mama made for me. You know, it, it's where, where do you put your treasure? Where do you put your treasure? If you put it in the right places, you know, you can be rich. And, and we, we are all filthy rich. I mean, we, we are, if you live in this country, I've read that, if you live in this country, you're richer than, what, 97 or 98 percent of the world's population? Just by living in this country. So, you know, I, I think about what Mike says. He comes back feeling sorry for us. We put our, we put our focus on the wrong things. That, that story you shared a couple of weeks ago, Dan, what, what country was that in? Guyana. That was in Guyana also? Yes. Well, there you go. So, did, did you come back feeling sorry for us? Yeah. Yeah. So let's put our, let's put our trust in the right things. You know, we're, we're as rich as we can be. And I hope it's because of the love that we have for God and the love that we have for each other. Are you a member of His family? Do you need to be baptized into Christ? Whatever the case may be, if we can help you in any way, please come now while together we stand and as we sing. There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us taste, oh, taste to His drink. Tis a fountain pray together. Gracious Father in heaven, we, uh, we come together tonight. We thank you for the blessing of being together on this dreary night, but it's a night that you, uh, you have given us here on this earth, Father, a time that we can come together and share our love for each other and our love for you as we worship you. Father, we are so thankful for the hope that we have through the faith that we, we find us in your love. Father, uh, you bless us so richly, and oftentimes we take that for granted. Most of the time we take it for granted. And we know that we, we have it good here, and we know that uh, you have something much, much better in store for us in the 
in the future, Father, through the sacrifice of your Son. Father, we, uh, we want to lift up those that are struggling right now with the loss of loved ones and those who are sick and those who have been injured. Father, we know that your love and your mercy is always there and you can provide healing and you can provide hope and you can comfort them as, as they need comforted. Father, uh, we pray that we keep you dear to us as we go through the rest of our week. Forgive us of our sins. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.